That would be, that's noteworthy. There you go. I, I, that's I, historic. I, man, I, you, know, um, you shouldn't even put that on the, our first nonprofit <laughs> cover ever. What's turning, what's Forbes turning into? <laughs> it's turning into a socialist magazine. Yeah. I, I think I, the, the only issue is the Forbes 400 issue is all about philanthropy this time. Mm. So, uh, the, which is coming out, and then we'd be following, and that's the argument. Oh, well, that's, we that's a very good. And we're fighting our, our competition yeah. is uh, the guy from Carlisle. So oh, uh, Schwarzman? No, no. Um, no, that's not Schwarzman. Uh, Roth, uh, oh, no, 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 no. Schwarzman is the yeah. guy. So we got like uh, Mega Billionaire and we got you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we've all heard from him before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's... Yeah, there are a bunch of billionaires, but only one. No, I'm, I'm really, this is actually one of the um, stories I'm, and I've been there for a long time and I'm most excited about. Um, I think it's really, I think what Saul's doing is pretty amazing. I really I really, I, I read his book yesterday. It's a great book. It's a very ambitious vision you have. Um, you got a book out? Yeah, I'll get you a copy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not out yet. So it's, okay. Uh, so we just got the crate from the publisher like two days ago. So yeah. I'm good. sure you'll sign it, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how's it called? One World Schoolhouse. The so one back to the whole one room school house. The one so on top of doing all the videos, you now also have time to write a book, right? Exactly. Oh yeah, you know, I'm, I go hang out. And, you know, I might, I'm working on a, a play right now too. <laughs> 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 yeah. Composing some melodies. And <laughs> Renaissance man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Doesn't sleep apparently. But, uh, I actually am thinking about doing, like all these like stories that I tell my son that I make up like on the fly. I have been thinking about just recording them and just yeah. Why not? Like, why not? I mean, like I tell the same story and like instead, I can just like play it on the iPhone and go to sleep. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the same story. It, no, it changes a little bit every okay. time, but yeah, I make a few of them. <laughs> and, uh, you kind of rotate yeah. them. Yeah, rotate them, but if I'm traveling, can reuse them. Exactly. <laughs> and if I'm traveling or something, I mean, you know, that is still there. And yeah. excuse me, you're, you just make sure I know that buzz is going to bother you now, but make sure that uh, ear tips, not yeah, gonna pop out of your yeah. ear. It's just kind of hanging out a little bit. Okay. Just making sure it doesn't pop out on you. I hope you hear me. Oh, I'll just kill the whole thing. <laughs> you can just kill it now. Oh, right now you can just. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then we won't hear her when she. I think they're speaking now. Oh, they are. Uh, oh yeah, they are. <laughs> I guess that would have been bad time. Yeah, just turn it down. So they're seeing us in real time. Or close to real time, and we just get a seven second delay. Or they're also probably. Everything's delayed. Everything's delayed. Yeah. Okay, so they'll. Okay, so we'll, <laughs> we'll look a little bit. Their voice is real. I mean, that's. Yeah, there was that, uh, yeah, the Boston. Yeah. yeah. I have, uh, yeah, every time, well, I mean, now that I know about you guys, like, whenever someone says, hey, can you come to Yalta? I was like, actually, I can do it virtually. <laughs> exactly. It always seems you and I are in here super early. Yes, exactly. Exactly. No, I should just get another little office right here. We just yeah. hang out. And God, he's going to be so tired. So uh, it was another conference? Yeah, it was, uh, it was the one for Fidelity. They were, just, yeah, it was just like. Boston. In Boston, yeah. I offered you it virtually. Oh, so. yes, what did you talk about? Same thing? Same thing. I, I mean, I don't know, but you know, I tutored my cousins. One thing led to another. Now I'm here. <laughs> <Yeah. It's, laughs> Did 
get some new sponsors since that time? We are, um, Anne and John Doerr gave us a pretty large donation okay. uh, or commitment uh, fairly recently. And uh, the Gates Foundation has given a little bit more. But yeah, no, we're looking to do kind of another round just so that we have a better runway for the next several years. Are you the same donor supporters entirely? Uh, um, not not long term. Yeah, so funding. so the self funding stuff and some of it started to fall in our lap, and we we think we could develop it is uh, licensing our content out. So there's someone launching a, you know, a, a for profit uh, tablet that they want to sell into schools, yeah. and so they're licensing our content for uh, you know fairly significant. Uh, you know, Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to lose right the now. satellite <coughs> connection if we will There's, not start uh, immediately. People we've just talked to, you know, Please take your seats. Шановні пані і панове, ми не зможемо продовжувати сесію з Тівілінком. Будь ласка, Okay, okay, let's begin our innovation session. And for people, for stragglers, I urge you to come in right now. This is gonna be the session that changes your life. It will tell you where to invest your money, what uh, degrees your children should be studying for, and where the future lies. <laughs> so big mistake to skip this one. Okay, uh, so we are going to be talking about innovation and the future. We've been talking about some pretty nitty-gritty political and economic <laughs> issues. Now is the opportunity to raise our gaze and look out at the more distant, exciting horizon. Uh, we have, we're going to have a conversation in two parts because appropriately enough, since we're talking about innovation, two of our participants are joining us by video link from Silicon Valley. We will see them in a moment. I did see them earlier. Uh, and the people joining us from Silicon Valley are really one of the most prescient, brilliant internet investors, Yuri Milner, who is the founder of DST Global Digital Sky Technologies. He made that brilliant early investment in Facebook, and the rest is history. Even with the lower share price, he's still doing OK. Uh, and with Yuri sitting beside him is Salman Khan. Uh, people, everyone here. I'm sure has heard of him. He is the founder of this terrific Khan Academy where he started to do videos to help his nieces and nephews do their homework. And he just did the videos himself to help them with their math homework. And it's become this huge sort of suite of educational videos really showing the way for the future of how we might use the internet to educate uh, our children. Uh, my children probably seem to use it more right now to entertain themselves, but I live in hope. Uh, and then our, the second part of our discussion will be with the gentlemen who are here with us. Eric Lander, he's the president and director of the Broad Institute. And just by way of introduction about Eric, uh, people who've been here before have heard from Larry Summers. Larry is an absolutely fabulous person. One quality he does not have is the ability to be hypocritical or to pay false compliments to anyone. And Larry also is a very smart person. I think the smartest person I know personally. And he said to me, Eric is the smartest person that Larry Summers knows. So that's the kind of thing. And we will also be hearing from Alec Ross. I'll tell you more about Alec after we've had our video link because I see the gentlemen, you've now appeared to us, Yuri and Salman, uh, and we would like to hear from you. So let's start with Yuri. Please, I know you're gonna show us a couple of slides and talk to us about the key places where you think innovation is happening in the world, and I'm challenging you to top your brilliant global brain observation of last year. Let's see if you can do it. Uh, Christia, can you see uh, the uh, the slides on the screen? I see your handsome face, Yuri, but not your brilliant slides. Yes, 
Yeah, I see your slides now. Excellent. So if you can, uh, if we can uh, show slide number one. Yeah. Can we turn to slide one? I'm sure it's not this opening piece. Okay. Yes, we see slide one, Yuri. Thank you. So I want to just briefly uh, tell you three stories about business innovation in the last 10 years. Uh, and this will really be just five slides. Uh, and will take about five minutes. But on the first slide, you see there's three main themes. The first story is about platform. The second story is about free. And the third story is about e-commerce. And all three stories were made <coughs> possible because of the massive investment in internet infrastructure that have been happening in the last 20 years. And that continues uh, right now. Uh, about $40 trillion uh, are being invested in, uh, in the 10 years between 2005 and 2015. So the first story is about platform. And uh, it's really an amazing uh, invention of a scalable business model that um, have never been seen before in the history of business. And the first example I want to use is uh, Amazon. Dot com. I'm sure everybody knows it's the largest e-commerce site on the internet. Um, the last known fact about Amazon is that about 2 million independent merchants are selling on that platform every day. And uh, that adds up to 25 billion of annual sales uh, at this point. Just to give you the comparison that if you would try to fit all these merchants in one big uh, shopping mall of a more traditional style, you would uh, need the space equal to uh, the island of Manhattan. And even if you could fit all these people in that big shopping mall, it will take a lot of time to find the, uh, the particular good that you've been looking for. And yet, in a matter of seconds and minutes, you are able to do it on Amazon without bringing all these people in one real estate location. So this was a major innovation in the last uh, 10 years, and uh, it really changed the way people uh, buy online and sell online. Facebook is my second example, with uh, about 500,000 applications on the Facebook platform and about 1 million developers uh, working on those applications. And just to uh, compare this 1 million developers with roughly 2,000 uh, employees uh, of Facebook that are really on a payroll, it's a massive uh, scalability uh, that is roughly 100, uh, 100 uh, multiple. And again, that scalability of, uh, of an outsource uh, have never been seen in the history of business. And my last example of uh, platform is uh, Apple. Uh, we all saw how Apple launched uh, their iPhone 5 uh, a couple of days ago. But again, it's a less known fact that there are 750,000 applications today on the platform, which is slightly different from what I have on the slide uh, that I did not have a chance to update the other day. But it's already 750,000 applications on Apple platform. And uh, billions of dollars are being paid every year to these developers to support their business. Can you please to, uh, turn to the next slide, number three? So this. Uh, this next slide is, uh, is about free, which is, uh, again, a business model which was uh, almost impossible uh, to design in any profitable fashion even, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and yet it was made possible by uh, connecting uh, uh, about a billion people online. 
and that made possible the creation of completely new massive brands like Google and Facebook with about uh, half a billion followers in a matter of years. And yet for comparison, I, um, I just put on a slide a few brands that we're all familiar with that have a comparable number of users uh, on a daily basis. And yet it took uh, many, many years, sometimes a uh, hundred years to build those brands. And that compares to just a few years uh, uh, to build internet brands of the same magnitude. And uh, one of the major reasons why it was possible is that uh, it was all of a sudden uh, have been uh, made possible to build, uh, to distribute these free services to huge uh, connected audiences. And the last story that I want to tell today, uh, if you can please turn to the next slide, which is number four. Um, And this story is about e-commerce. And here I'm comparing a traditional uh, retail business model with uh, online uh, e-commerce business model. And we have done the math to try to calculate the impact of uh, commerce really shifting from more traditional to uh, more modern. And the uh, net benefit to society turns out to be a massive 8% uh, difference. Uh, that translates into roughly $1 trillion uh, uh, if you look at the global retail. It will not happen overnight, but uh, in the next 20 years, we believe that uh, that is the size of the impact. And what is interesting is that our early observations show that more than three quarters of this benefit will accrue to consumers, while uh, only one quarter will, uh, will accrue to the businesses that will participate in this massive transition. And uh, the, uh, the next slide, number five, uh, basically shows how fast this transition is happening. With 6% uh, of all e-commerce happening through internet uh, today, and that is exponentially escalating to 20% in 10 years and 50% uh, uh, in 20 years, with a pretty dramatic impact uh, in, many, uh, in many ways, but one that I wanted to emphasize today that the cost of that efficiency would be a pretty significant job loss in, uh, in retail sector to the tune of 40 million jobs in the next 20 years. That roughly translates in about 2 million jobs uh, uh, per year. Um, and our assumption is really that that uh, the job loss will uh, really be compensated by completely new jobs that will be created uh, that would uh, really be um, higher paid jobs uh, in uh, technology sector rather than just pure retail. So that basically completes my uh, short presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Yuri, for that presentation. Uh, very thought provoking as ever. How, I would just like to ask you a couple of follow up questions as you suggest. Um, how do you think this is changing businesses outside the internet space? So you've talked about the impact of e-commerce on traditional retail. Is this having a broader impact you know, beyond Silicon Valley transforming the way business works? Uh, well, I... Um uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, it's, it's really about uh, something that we call the disruption, and it goes well beyond Silicon Valley. We know that you know, retail is really um, one of the major sectors in the economy, and this major sector is being um, really disrupted in a, in a major way as we speak. It started from a low base, and uh, uh, it was really invisible 10 years ago with about 1% uh, 
of uh, all retail happening online. But this effect will be very visible in the next 20 years, culminating in something like 50%. Of course, it goes well beyond retail. There are many other sectors that are being uh, changed and revolutionized. And that includes uh, content distribution, something that my neighbor will uh, talk about uh, briefly uh, in a few minutes. And uh, it goes all the way to uh, uh, education, uh, medicine, and many other sectors. Yuri, uh, Victor has asked that uh, in this panel we focus a lot on the future and on big questions. Um, something that you've done very recently uh, was a sort of a philanthropic act designed to help all of humanity focus more on the big questions. Could you just talk about that a little bit and the motivation for it? Yeah, you're talking about Beauty. philanthropic acts to move humanity in a big way okay. that you've done. Okay. Uh, Christy, you might be talking about the physics prize yes. that uh, was launched uh, really a few weeks uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, it's called the Fundamental Physics Award, and it really meant to uh, um, uh, to highlight and uh, and focus on uh, the smartest people in the world who are really pushing the envelope of knowledge. Um, and uh, my, uh, my idea was really to uh, um, just maybe send a message how important that occupation is and that it, uh, from my standpoint, really defines us as human beings. Um, it really, I think, is important to, uh, um, to try to uh, rebalance slightly the uh, financial benefits that our society is, uh, is, uh, is gaining in favor of this uh, very smart people who are in many ways are invisible and unknown to, uh, to the world, and yet they are really trying to push the envelope and understand how the universe came to be. So Eric, I'm sure as a scientist yourself, you're in favor of that. And for people who don't know about Yuri's prize, he, he launched it by picking a group of physicists who will be in future the jury uh, for subsequent awards. And he just gave each one of them a million dollars. Uh, $3 million each, $3 million each. And I talked to some of these guys, and they said uh, that what happened was someone just phoned them up. Um, Yuri didn't call directly the ones who he didn't know because when I spoke to these physicists, they said maybe Yuri thought that if some guy with a Russian accent called us up and said, I'm giving you $3 million, give me your bank account details, please, that they might be suspicious. So he got physicists who knew them to call them up and say, yeah, you're going to get $3 million. And all the ones who I talked to said, you mean just for me personally? It's not the prize that's distributed over years. It's not the endowment. So it really uh, was a step change in the lives of these individuals. Um, Yuri, I'll just a final question about this, and then we'll ask Salman a few questions. Um, could you just elaborate on, on this actually rather provocative point you've just made? That you don't think the rewards are great enough in society, including the financial rewards? for people who are engaged in this sort of scientific thinking on the frontiers. Um, you certainly are a person who has benefited from the way financial rewards are distributed in our society right now. I mean, why do you think our system isn't ideal? Um. Well, I, um, I think that um, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I think it was not always the case. I think uh, the uh, situation sort of changed in the last 50 years. Um, I think uh, there was a time when uh, there was a significantly more 
resources invested in science and uh, fundamental science in particular. Uh, when, uh, when I was really a, a scientist uh, about 20 years ago, that was uh, still something that really attracted significant attention. Uh, but unfortunately, what I have personally seen in the last uh, 20 years was a gradual um, slow down in uh, investment levels in fundamental science, uh, both in um, experiment and theory. And uh, um, I think it's uh, a little bit unfortunate that uh, this is sort of the current trend. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that we'll have other people have a chance to ask you a question or two. Uh, maybe even Speaker Gingrich, I know he's very interested in fundamental science, has done a lot of thinking about it. Um, but I'd like to expand the conversation to include Salman. Hi, Salman, thank you for joining us. Um, Salman, could you start by telling us a little bit about how your own work and the technology revolution overall that Yuri has been talking about is going to affect education? Yeah, it, it, it's still a, a, an uncertain future here, but uh, as, as was introduced, you know, I got started really just putting uh, tutorials up for my cousins on, on YouTube, uh, just thinking it might be some, something somewhat helpful for them, and they somewhat famously told me that they, they liked me better on YouTube than in person, uh, so, so I, just, I just kept going, and uh, it, it soon became clear that uh, people who were not my cousins uh, were finding value from this, and, and soon it was hundreds of thousands and, and millions of people, now it's five million uh, uh, people a month. and. Um, and it was really the uh, teachers and students and parents writing letters to me that made it more clear to me what this could be. I assumed that this was just going to be this nice little uh, supplemental thing that you get online. I had started writing some software so that people could get practice problems and that their code could keep track of it. And I started getting letters from teachers early on uh, saying, look, you know, you've already given a pretty good lecture on, on taking a derivative or factoring a polynomial or whatever it might be. And uh, they said, well, you know, so why should I give that lecture anymore inside the classroom? I could use a classroom for, for higher value things. And so these teachers, and this was in like 97 before uh, 2007, before Khan Academy was a uh, somewhat of a real organization, I was—it was just me operating. At, it, you know, I, I was actually a hobby at the time. Uh, I had a day job at an investment firm, and. Um, and, and just that simple thing actually transformed the idea of what a classroom was. A classroom was no longer a place where a, a professor would sit up front, give a one-pace fits-all lecture to all of the students, and instead it could become a collaborative, uh, interactive place where people are problem solving. And a lot of what traditionally happened inside of a classroom uh, could happen at a student's own time, student's own pace, and it could happen anywhere. And uh, students didn't have to be embarrassed to raise their hand and say, you know, I, even though we're in an algebra class, I forgot a little bit of my uh, negative numbers or multiplying decimals and a student didn't have to be bored. If they wanted to go ahead, they could start doing it. And so uh, we, at that time I, but now we're a much larger organization, we're 36 people, so we're not huge. Uh, we started thinking about, well, what, what are these tools really mean for education? And, and what we've realized more recently, we've started working with many, many more schools. We've gotten significant funding from, from many uh, uh, people in the last few years. We're, we're operating as a not-for-profit is now that you have tools like these videos, the self-paced exercises we have, dashboards, analytics for teachers, uh, we can move to a reality where we can start to rethink this, this kind of industrial revolution inspired model of education that, that we all grew up in. This, you know, the traditional model, all the students are batched into these age-based cohorts. They're pushed together at a set pace. And what's variable is how well they understand things. And these are these things called grades that we've all uh, kind of assumed as part of the system. And what we're saying is, oh, there's, there's an opportunity now to completely turn it around. Instead, we can have every student going at their own pace, mastering concepts before moving on. And, it's, and so what's variable now is when and how long they learn something. And what's fixed is that they all have a high level of mastery. And if they have the luxury of going to a physical classroom, obviously this has implications for people in, 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 in poorer parts, developing parts of the world where they have access to nothing. So now they will have something. But if you have the luxury of a physical classroom, you can now use that physical classroom for more interesting things, actually interacting with the teacher, doing problem solving, doing more, more, more creative tasks. So, uh, you know, 
know, I, I, I'm personally pretty excited. I, you know, I, I always feel in any, in any industry or market or sector, whenever people are getting most cynical, most pessimis pessimistic, that's when um, there's about to be a major transformation. And I, and, I think, and I think it's going to be a very positive one in education. Expensible luxury. Can you imagine a time when people won't go to classrooms? When you know the majority of learning will be online and, and maybe solo, maybe without teachers. You know, well, I, I, I think there's two parts of it. I mean, you know, I, I have very young children. I imagine them going to a physical classroom. Uh, education is more than just the processing of information. There's a socialization aspect to it. There's also credentialing. The credentialing aspect can happen uh, kind of virtually. Even parts of socialization can happen. But I think there's a, a huge value of, of kind of interacting with humans in a room and, and, and doing tangible projects and, and maturing and growing and, and, and working with your peers. With that said, um, you know, I think the, the somewhat of the irony is even before technology existed, I think most of the learning actually does happen on your own. I mean, if you go to a, any college campus and you, you ask how much do students are getting from the lectures versus, you know, the, the cramming on, in the library, um, it, it, it might be a significant portion of, of, of the latter. And so I, I imagine a world where for people, you know, especially the developed world, wealthier countries where you do have access to uh, and the resources for physical classrooms, I think those will always be there. I think they'll always be incredibly, incredibly valuable. There's nothing that can replace that mentorship, that connection that I had with my co with my cousins. I think, and th but as, as you go into the developing world or places with fewer resources, I think yes, it, it will become very powerful. And 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 virtual will not just be informational delivery. It can also provide um, socialization. You know, I I I I I talk a lot about this idea of. We've been working with schools in Silicon Valley where because all the students are working at their own pace, class time isn't lecture-based anymore, you have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer instruction. And, and that obviously helps the student who's getting tutored, but it, it also helps the student who's doing the tutoring. It allows them to master the concepts, learn to empathize, learn to communicate. And uh, we don't see any reason why that can't happen cross-border. And, and obviously, that has huge implications. It, it obviously will give access to students who might not have someone in their village who knows calculus or trigonometry. But I also think it helps kind of ease tensions cross-culturally and things like that. So I, I, I think it's a little bit of both. There will always be physical, but for students who don't have that, they'll still get something powerful. OK, Salman, quick final question from me. What's it going to do to the financial model of education? I have three kids. I won't tell you how much I pay to educate them in Manhattan because I will start to cry. Uh, does this mean that I can stop doing that and just give them computers, which they already have? <laughs> so the financial model is interesting. I think the, the, the area that's most ripe for innovation or disruption or whatever you want to call it is definitely higher education. Um, it's becoming somewhat obvious, uh, you know, I, I, they, they, I don't think they fully understood the idea of demand destruction when you're increasing tuition 5% faster than inflation on a regular basis. And, and I, I, you know, right now you have this situation, people go into sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, debt that is not, the only type of debt that's not cancelable by bankruptcy, and then they go on the other side of that equation, and then they can't, they can't find a job. And, and I think there's a huge disconnect going on in higher education between what parents and students think they're paying for when they, when they, when they spend $50,000, $100,000 and invest four years of their life or five years. Uh, they think they're paying for a, a token, a credential, that's going to have uh, a meaning, a signal in the job market, while the universities often themselves say, well, no, 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 you know, we're providing a, a holistic experience here. Uh, one, you know, obviously a credential is part of it, but most of the resources, these, the, the $100,000, $200,000, is being invested in, 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 in kind of the, the learning end of, of, of uh, and the, the experiential end of education. And, I so, and so you have this major transaction, a significant fraction of someone's lifetime earnings where the person is paying for something that's different than the person who, who believes that what, what, they're, what they're offering or what they're selling. And so I think there will always be physical universities, but I think there's going to be more clarity to that part of the ecosystem where learning can happen however someone sees fit. Uh, it could be virtually, it could be on the job, it could be at the community college, it could be at the university, because I think uh, especially a lot of the, the more known universities will always have an important aspect of, of socializing you, being able to form a network, but then decoupled from that, will be a credentialing mechanism. Because right now you have the problem, if you go to a less known university and you, you learn things incredibly well, 
uh, you spend $100,000, six years of your life, you still end up with a degree that if you go into the next state or the next country, people might not know what that means. And so I, I definitely imagine a world where uh, regardless of how you learn something, you can go and take assessments, could be very rich assessments, richer than anything that goes on on existing uh, campuses today, where people can prove that they know something that has uh, a lot of meaning in, in, in inside of the marketplace. And to some degree, I think that'll purify the role of, of the university. You, you won't have this strange tension where, you know, people are learning Shakespeare so that they can get a job as an analyst at Goldman Sachs. And so uh, I, I think, and, and, and obviously a lot of those same ideas apply K through 12. I think across the whole spectrum, K through college, historically we've had a seat time based model. You sit for a certain number of years and we give you a degree. You know, in the university level, you literally describe credits in terms of credit hours. How many hours a week did you spend on this thing? I think we're going to move to a competency based model where it's regardless of how you learned it, regardless of how long it took you, do you know this thing? And if you know it, take a test, it could be a very rigorous test, and then the world will believe you. I agree with everything that Salman said. It's very intriguing with one exception. I think that Shakespeare is excellent training for Goldman Sachs, particularly the Lady Macbeth line. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent beneath it. I mean, they could carve that on the wall outside. Okay. Um, Yuri and Salman, I hope you'll stay with us for a moment because I am really looking forward to hearing from Eric and Alec. Um, Eric? Please talk to us. You can talk to us about Silicon Valley and innovation, but you are working in particular on another very exciting frontier of innovation, you know, to do with our bodies, ourselves. No, I, I work in genetics, have worked on the Human Genome Project, and you know, I sit here listening to the exciting presentations this morning, panels about urgent issues, economic crises, security issues, the election in 50 some odd days, and absolutely nothing that I'm going to talk about has impacts on that time scale. But the sort of things that innovation does have impacts on time scales like 10 years, but huge impacts, huge impacts. And I think that's the interesting thing. So we could talk, we've, we've talked about it in IT today. We could talk about it in energy, and there are some interesting things to talk about there. We could talk about it in manufacturing, where there are really interesting changes afoot. But let me start by talking about it with respect to the biological sciences, the biomedical sciences. So on IT, you heard this amazing transformation that's happening because of the ability to aggregate information, share that information, analyze that information, and it's driven all sorts of business efficiencies. You can start an IT business 100 times cheaper than you used to be able to. You can disintermediate education. So why is that? Well, it's because effectively of what technologists call Moore's Law. The idea that the power of a computer doubles every 18 months or so. And compound interest on doubling every 18 months is pretty good. It gets you 100 times better after a decade. It gets you a million times better after 30 years. And that's what we've seen. We've seen now that that return has really paid off with a million-fold increase in computing power. So I look at my own field. My own field, I work on DNA. I work on genetics. I was part of this human genome project, a wonderful international project started around 1990, finished around 2003, with the goal of reading out the complete genetic code of the human being and making it freely available to everybody in the world. It was a project that the US was involved in and in the United Kingdom and France and Germany and Japan and China, those six countries leading the way, but putting the data all out there. So. Um, you know, we were proud of ourselves. We got the human genome sequenced. We got it out there. But that was 2003. What is stunning is what has happened since 2003, and you may not know it. The power of DNA sequencing has increased since then by about 100,000-fold. Not the 100-fold you'd get from Moore's Law, but about 100,000-fold. If I stretch back a little bit further than, than that to about 13, 14 years ago, we've gotten about a million-fold increase in just a bit more than a decade. That is stunning. 
Because in the same way that the internet and computing is making it possible to gather and share and analyze large amounts of data, that's what's going to be happening in medicine. We see it already. Whereas we spent the entire world working for a decade to get one human genome, we now have tens of thousands of human genome sequences, almost all generated in the last three years. The impact of this is stunning. We are beginning to read out the information and associate it with who gets what diseases. Now, this is none too soon. This is urgent stuff. Because if we think about the world's needs in medicine, they are extraordinary. The speaker has pointed out about Alzheimer's disease, I think, very, very convincingly. This is a $1 trillion a year drain that we will be looking at in the American economy and in other countries as well. I, have, I know the American number offhand, but this will grow to about a trillion dollars a year of economic impact. We look at an aging population and the effects on cancer, cancer rates. So we also look in the world of China and India, and China and India, as they are rapidly developing, are acquiring the rates of heart disease and diabetes that we see in the Western world. They are massive epidemics of heart disease and diabetes. And then there are things that you don't even think so much about, but matter. Infectious diseases, like, for example, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is still a serious scourge in this world. Here in the Ukraine, it is, a, it is the leading cause of death from a treatable infectious disease. Uh, and here, 20% of the tuberculosis in the Ukraine is multi-drug resistant. Diseases that are multi-drug resistant and you can spread by coughing should scare you. So there are a whole series of needs that we have from Alzheimer's to cancer to heart disease to diabetes to tuberculosis. And being able to crack open the information in cells is really an incredibly important hope. So when we look at cancer right now, Cancer is, well, the reason we've made very little progress against cancer, well, we've made it against some childhood cancers and some certain types of, is cancer is not one disease. When 10 people have lung cancer, they have different mechanisms that have gone wrong, different circuits are broken. But it's never been possible to say which circuit is broken in which patient. So as you can look now at the DNA of the cancer and at the DNA of the patient, and compare them, the normal DNA and the tumor DNA, you can write down where there are changes, where there are mutations. And you can begin to saturate and learn all the tricks of lung cancer, all the tricks of head and neck cancer, of skin cancer. We're not there yet, but just in the past two or three years, we've probably gotten 30% of the way to having a complete catalog. And I have no qualms about saying over the next five years, we'll have the complete catalog of what are the circuits that are broken. And as patients come in, we'll know what's broken. Now, what's broken doesn't tell you immediately how to fix it. That I don't want to pretend that knowing the cause of a disease automatically gives you a therapy. But not knowing the cause of a disease is really bad if you're trying to make a therapy. So what we're going to have is an explosion of effort to create therapies based on actual causes as opposed to just treating symptoms. And it's already happening. In the United States, I know more than 800 cancer drugs are already under development, most of them based on genomic information. But we've got to match them up to the right patients. Which patients have the circuits that match those diseases? And the only way this is going to happen is by being able to combine the world's data. We need data in Boston and data in Germany and data in the Ukraine and in China on what, what particular mutations patients have. And we need to share that data because no one city, no one hospital, no one country is big enough to, to really extract all that information. So there's going to be an information sharing aspect of this biology over the coming decade that's exciting and it's important and it's going to drive a tremendous amount of economic development. In the United States, healthcare is about a sixth of our economy. We think a lot about anything that can have an impact on healthcare costs. And then when I look to Eastern Europe, I say, interestingly, Eastern Europe doesn't play in this field. There's not significant biomedical research of this sort in Eastern Europe. And when I talk to Victor's young kids later tonight, I'm going to point out to them, this is a huge open area for Eastern Europe to be thinking about. So anyway, that's just reading DNA. If I had more time, I would tell you about writing DNA. 
There's a huge effort now in synthetic DNA, being able to write your own DNA sequences. Secretary Rice said it wasn't in her DNA to be able to run for president. Well, in the next decade or so, you'll be able to write things in your DNA, and perhaps the Republican Party will be interested in writing. So, no, I don't seriously mean that you can write that, but you will be able to write circuits in DNA, and we will see a generation of kids coming along who write the equivalent of computer programs, but with DNA. Just like computer programs here in the Ukraine write C++ code, there will be D++ code of DNA. Anyway, these are the sort of things that I bet you don't know about, and I bet it won't matter to you in the next 18 months fixing the world, but it may have a pretty big impact on this world going beyond that point. So it's at least worth being aware of. Okay, what I want to ask you about later, Eric, is can you write... Yeah. Is, uh, can you write DNA to make me taller? Um, we're it's gonna a bit hear, late. A bit late, yeah. Um, we're going to lose our satellite link to the West Coast in a couple of minutes. So we have concluding moments from our friends visiting us there. Um, Yuri, any concluding thoughts? Maybe a response to Eric's thoughts? Maybe it's time for you to start giving $3 million prizes to geneticists working at the cutting edge as well? Well, um, I think we've just heard a uh, pretty amazing uh, summary of what is coming in the next 10 years. And I think there is a very interesting link between uh, sort of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, type progress and genomics type progress. Uh, I think there is a, a pretty uh, uh, interesting conversion that I see coming in the same time frame of 10 years whereby you would uh, really have uh, people writing different kind of code and uh, making computations that will uh, save people's lives. Thank you very much, Yuri. And Victor particularly asked me to thank you and Salman because we appreciate that it's 7 a.m. there now. You must have been awake since at least 5 o'clock in the morning to get to the studios to set everything up and so on. So. Спасибо вам огромное. And uh, Salman, any concluding thoughts? No, you hear all of this, uh, everything that's going on. I mean, I, it's, you sometimes have to remind yourself, I mean, this, is, is, this would have been all crazy talk 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so it really feels like we're all living in the middle of a science fiction book. So it's pretty exciting. OK, that's a, a good. Concluding thought, thank you very much to both of you. Uh, now, last but very much not least, we're going to hear from Alec Ross. Alec Ross is in the State Department, their innovation and internet guy. He goes around, one of his many tasks is to help teach the ambassadors how to use Twitter and Facebook. I first heard of him, it's actually true, I first heard of him because I was talking to Mike McFall, uh, the US ambassador to Russia, and Mike, all of a sudden, he got to Moscow. He had never been on Twitter. Suddenly, he was tweeting like a mad fiend, really interestingly. And so I said, Mike, I've known Mike for 20 years, and I said, you know, Mike, what happened? Did your kids show you how to do this or what? And he said, ah, they have a special training program for us at the State Department, and there's this really visionary, brilliant guy who is teaching the State Department how to take diplomacy into cyberspace, and his name is Alec Ross. I also want to share with you one other key crucial fact, and when Alec told me this, everything became clear, which is his great-grandfather is Ukrainian from <laughs> Kyiv. It gets better. His great-grandfather was an anarchist, and actually what I didn't say to Alec is all Ukrainians are anarchists. <laughs> It's in the Ukrainian DNA. That causes some problems, as you can see, when it comes to governance. Okay, everyone really is Ukrainian. Yuri, of course, Ukrainian. There you go. Um, so, Alec, please talk to us about innovation, diplomacy, anything else that helps us to understand the next frontier. 
Sure, well, thank you. So most of the people who I spoke to before coming on this panel said, said you know, Alec, you've been an entrepreneur before you came into government. You, you know, helped build a bridge between Barack Obama and Silicon Valley during his campaign. And now for Hillary Clinton, give us some advice as Europeans about what we can do to make Europe more Silicon Valley-like. What, what can we do to unleash innovation and entrepreneurship here? So I'm speaking, sure, as an official representative of the State Department, but actually more of what uh, I'll speak from is the perspective of having previously been an entrepreneur myself who built a company that started in a basement and got to be a pretty good-sized company. Um, the first piece of advice I would give is to government, which is you've got to get out of the way. Government, sh the government role in innovation and entrepreneurship should principally be to unleash it. I think that, unfortunately, all too often, the tendency of people hearing the brilliant stories of people like Salman and Eric and Yuri would be, that's really interesting. How do we regulate it? And this, look, this is, this is cancer for entrepreneurship. You cannot regulate or litigate your way to job growth. You have to innovate. We live in a truly global world, 195 countries on planet Earth. And if the, if the impulse of government when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation is to try to control it or hyper-regulate it, look, you're not just competing with the United States, you're competing with India, with China, with Indonesia, with Singapore, with Chile, with Brazil, and you're going to lose. If you think of the role, of your role in government as to control entrepreneurship or to manage it, rather you should be trying to, to create an ecosystem that unleashes it, that supports it. I think that's very important. Um, and, I, and I also think it's very important to think about this in terms of, of corruption. I think that when you think about a lot of innovation of the past 10 to 15 years, a lot of it has been in IT. It's been in the internet. People have been able to start companies in, out of their graduate school classrooms or out of their dorm rooms. But I think if you think about large-scale innovation over the next 10, 10 to 15 years, it's going to be in areas like clean technology, life sciences, material sciences, robotics, fields like these. And these are fields that are going to require factories. They're going to require large-scale investment and other such things. And if you want to start a large company that does disruptive innovation in these large-scale areas, you can't go into these fields knowing that you're going to have to give away 15% of your company to an equity partner who's going to protect you politically. Or that you're going to have to, you know, you're going to get a visit every three months from a tax auditor or other, or other such things. So one honest piece of advice I have to government is you've got to think about innovation and entrepreneurship not as something that you should control or regulate, but that you should figure out how to nurture and unleash. Uh, the second pieces of advice that I would give are really cultural. And one goes to the issue of fear. Uh, I think one of the things I'm worried about is how much gray twilight there is in Europe right now. A great American president named Theodore Roosevelt said, it's far better to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they dwell in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. So let me ask you all, how many of you uh, own a Next computer? How many of you own or have used an Apple product? Okay, Steve Jobs, after he, got, after he failed and got fired from Apple, he started Next Computer, and relative to his ambitions, he failed, so he had largely failed twice. And then he went back to Apple, and on his third try, completely revolutionized information communications technology. I think that in too many places, he wouldn't have gotten that third chance. How many of you use Microsoft products? How many of you use Novell products? How many of you have heard of Google? <laughs> okay, Eric Schmidt, chairman and recently the CEO of Google, Prior to becoming chairman and CEO of Google, he was the CEO of a company called Novell. He, and having not succeeded at Novell to topple Microsoft, he then got a chance to be the CEO of Google. We, 
I think too often we overpunish failure. And, and this isn't about Europe, this is about much of the United States as well. I'm talking about one of the smart things that people do in Silicon Valley that I think the rest of the United States can learn from, as well as the rest of the world, is that we've got to understand that people can learn from failure. And we've got to, we've got to stay out of the gray twilight and seek to both win big and lose big, knowing that that is really what's gonna unleash innovation. And then my third and final point in terms of giving advice uh, relates to youth. Um, the great innovations over the next 10 to 15 years are gonna come from very young people. I'm 40 years old. I didn't send or receive a single email when I was in college. I didn't own a mobile phone until I was 20 years old. But people who are 30 years old and younger are like fish in water, water when it comes to of the digital domain, they're getting great educations increasingly in the science space. And so for people who come to me, you know, uh, from positions of power and they say, well, what can I do to get in early in these, in these deals? You know, how can I find these great entrepreneurs? I say, well, look, they're all over the place uh, in whatever city you live in. You know, they're, they're in university right now. Mark Zuckerberg was a 19-year-old college dropout when he got his first infusion of $500,000 to commercialize Facebook. Uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, when, when they first got their first very significant injection of capital, had, neither of them had ever had jobs before, and what they were doing was commercializing a, a graduate school program. And so my key message to those of you in power and who have significant personal wealth is know that in Silicon Valley, the wealthier you are, the more time you spend with people in your 20s. It's really interesting. And it's not about, oh, it'll take you two months to get a meeting and then you can come in and I can bestow wisdom on you. No, the really smart people in Silicon Valley who have been successful quite often, remember that they only have one mouth but they have two ears. And they bring these young people in and they invest in them. And they invest in them aggressively. And they recognize that if they invest in 10 of these 19, 20, 21 year olds, eight or nine of those are gonna fail, but one or two of them might be, might be big. So I just wanted to give those three pieces of advice uh, for what can create a more entrepreneurial and innovation friendly ecosystem uh, in Europe and beyond. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alec. And I, for one, definitely detected echoes of that anarchist great-grandfather when yeah. you talked about avoiding the gray twilights and living large, you know, trying to do something great even if you fail. I think he's That's still right. there. Um, we have only about 10 minutes left. And so I would... Yeah. And so I would love to throw things open to the floor. Yeah? So do people have questions? What, come on, how can you not have questions after these great presentations? Please. Good afternoon, my name is Yarena Klyuchkovska, I represent Microsoft. Um, we keep talking and hearing about Ukraine's great potential for innovation. It seems to be in people's DNA, I like being a good example, I guess. Um, having transported overseas. Um, just a recent example, a group of four Ukrainian students recently won a huge international student IT competition run by Microsoft. They developed a glove that translates sign language into human voice and written word. So people who are challenged uh, in terms of being deaf and mute can communicate. Amazing piece of technology. Uh, we have... Um, 100,000 professional software developers, but 80% of them are involved in offshore programming. Means that they don't create innovation for Ukraine. Ukraine only gets the minimal amount of taxes from their salaries. So my question, I guess mostly to you, Alec, would be, um, I get the message about the government not sort of being overbearing and not trying to control the industry, but what are the prerequisites? What are maybe the policies that have to be in place so that we as a country can turn that potential into something real and turn it into the engine for economic growth? Thank you. For me, th for me the question is not what can government do, but what should government not do? Uh, so again, like there's one, I won't speak specifically about Ukraine because I'm sure you know more U about Ukraine than me, but I'll give an example. There's one Mediterranean country where if the company fails, 
the average amount of time, the average amount of time it takes to go through a bankruptcy proceeding is nine years. So my friends in Silicon Valley who are centimillionaires and billionaires will never invest in this country because it takes nine years to get through the bankruptcy process. I, I'm not going to say. You can find out. Uh, so I would look to country, I would look at examples like Estonia. So what Estonia did is they built a, they built a beautiful electronic uh, interface where what you can do is you can start a company in an afternoon online. You can get a fully registered, licensed, tax compliant and everything else. You don't have to go to 14 offices and stand in 14 lines and have a bureaucrat put a stamp on a piece of paper. Rather, they've created an electronic interface that it makes it easy to do the transaction. So part of what I would do is I would actually map everything that government is doing right now, then figure out what you can take out, and those things which are still necessary, say, okay, what can we now make more easy? like licensing and other such things. Okay, thank you very much. Anders Asland has a question. Microphone. Thank you very much, excellent presentations. I would like to ask both of you about intellectual property rights. Here in Ukraine, the big concern is that intellectual property rights are not recognized fully and are not effective. In the United States today, we have the opposite uh, problem, that we are seeing intellectual property rights causing a great danger of a monopoly uh, with uh, the big giants buying up lots of patents and then suing anybody of these small entrepreneurs you talked about, Alec, and saying that we have already done what you did, or anyhow, we have so many patents, you can never prove that you, do, uh, you have done anything new. How do you see what should be the right balance here? What should one aim for? Thank you. Yeah, I'll speak briefly. So first of, first of all, for Ukraine to truly realize its potential, it has to operate within globally accepted norms and financial systems. And that includes respecting intellectual property rights. I mean, Ukraine will, will, will isolate itself if entrepreneurs who come here or who try to seek their products and services here know that they can't commercialize it. In any ca functional capitalist system, there's remuneration for, for reasonable intellectual property rights. Uh, now to speak to the second part of that, um, there is a difficult balance to achieve between uh, protecting intellectual property and um, people who predate on the intellectual property system. What you, the phrase, the, the, the moniker used for people who basically gobble up thousands of patents, as you described it, are patent trolls. Um, and, and that's a problem, and it's very hard to construct an, an intellectual property scheme that both allows people to invest uh, broadly, because you know one ought not constrain one's ability to, to buy intellectual property. The, more, the most difficult area, in my, in my opinion, in this area is actually internet related. Because the internet is so wildly disruptive. And one of the areas where it's been very disruptive has been in the area of intellectual property. And one area uh, that I'm very glad both, both Democrats and Republicans, by and large, came together uh, to agree was on a couple pieces of proposed legislation in the United States, SOPA and PIPA, uh, the Stop Online Piracy Act and, and the Protect IP Act. So I was very, very glad to see leadership, not just from the Obama administration, saying we will not uh, support uh, intellectual property legislation that inhibits innovation or free speech, but also saw it from congressional Republicans and Democrats as well, who said, let's not break, let's not disrupt the way in which the internet works. Let's keep it a relatively open platform that lends itself to investment and innovation. So, I agree with your advice to Ukraine, which is respect intellectual property by international norms, but there's another answer to that too, which is, have the international norms got it right? And we haven't always got it right. I'm not sure Ukraine should be an innovator in trying to fix that point. <laughs> but I do think governments make enormously consequential choices in deciding what is an inventive step to be rewarded with a 20-year monopoly. 
If you get it wrong in either direction, you create big problems. In my own field in human genetics, there was a time that everyone was racing to the patent office to patent genes based on teeny bits of their sequence. This was as if we were giving away land in the United States for simply stopping by and having lunch there, rather than, say, the Homestead Act in the 1800s, where you really had to work the land. If you get that balance wrong, it's a serious issue. So we've now restored that with regard to genes. You've actually really got to come up with some meaningful use for that gene. You can't just tell me it might be a target for drug development. I think biology is getting this about right right now. I'm not sure we have this right with regard to software patents. When I look at, I mean, I have very close friends at Apple, but whether or not rounded edges on an icon represent something that government should give, be giving monopolies on for as an inventive step as opposed to, say, trademark. I have no problem with trademarks, copyrights on things, but inventions that, that you, you know, th these are serious issues. So I think as a world, we've got to get the balance right because one thing governments have to do to create this innovation ecosystem is to protect true invention, but that not go run around awarding monopoly for what is not real invention, because that becomes, in effect, regulation as well on, on new innovators. Okay, yeah, I think that's a very powerful point. Thank you. We have time for one last question, so here it is. Um, we've had from you, sir, how innovation can help us to meet with illnesses of various kinds. And we have, from the other gentleman, a suggestion that intellectual property rights should apply to innovations in medicine. Now, as a result of innovations in medicine acquiring property rights, which amount to monopoly, there are millions of people who are already dying around the world. And where, how do you strike the balance there? And is it to be limited to medicine? Or are there other areas in which uh, I think the need to strike a balance is there? For if you have a patent regime of the kind that we have just now, it certainly encourages innovation, but it also encourages a great deal of injustice in the world. I, I very much resonate with the question that, that you are posing here. We have seen solutions to this with regard to HIV medications where we have come up with regimes to make these available much closer to their true cost of manufacture um, than the hundredfold higher costs that at times were being charged. It took a world coming together to say that this is indeed an unjust situation. And even as we protect the intellectual property right in developed countries, we must make this available in much less developed countries. And I think we need regimes to do that. At the same time, one of our great problems with patent rights on drugs is that we don't have enough drugs. The only reason somebody can charge you $200,000 for a cancer treatment is there aren't four equivalent competing cancer treatments that would drive the cost down to the cost of manufacture. And so part of our problem with drug development is it is stunningly inefficient. We develop drugs and spend a billion dollars, several billion dollars per drug when you include amortized failure, because we don't know how to develop a drug. It's as if Boeing developed airplanes by building the entire airplane, rolling it up to the edge of the cliff, pushing it off and seeing if it flies. If it didn't have computers and the laws of, of airflow and all that, we do this so inefficiently. So on the one hand, at the moment, that's no answer. We have to do this through international regimes that address justice. On the other hand, drug development is so stunningly inefficient that I want to see a world a few decades from now where, in fact, smart young companies like Yuri's companies with smart young entrepreneurs and these smart young Ukrainians who are doing it in IT can do this in medicine. Because in the long run, the solution is more innovation all being protected. So anyway, it's, it's a two-part answer, and, and uh, what can I say? It is really a problem. I think a lot about it, worry about it. Okay, so partly as a bridge between our two panels, uh, one of the stars of our next panel speaking about the future of capitalism will be Richard Branson, but he knows a thing or two about innovation, including the ultimate frontier, which is space. 
And I wonder if you'd like to just say a few words about that. Um, would I like to say a few words about that? Um, uh, well, uh, obviously, um, Russia, Ru yeah, up until now, you just had Russia and America who've been um, uh, as state-run state uh, companies uh, offering um, sp space travel. And, um, and they've done it in an incredibly you know, an exciting way, but very, very inefficient way for, for, um, uh, for the cost. So, uh, you know, an American spaceship costs about 1.25 billion every time it goes up. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, it, it is quite, it's quite strange to see a Democrat, democratic um, government uh, pushing um, and saying, saying that, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of NASA is wrong rather than a Republican government. Um, but um, uh, but uh, what Obama has done is basically said, uh, you know, let's use NASA as, uh, as, a, as an umbrella and, and, um, and let's um, encourage the private sector to get out there and build um, space, uh, spaceship companies. And, um, and you know, we, we were fortunate to come across a, a genius in Bert Rutan who's um, uh, just about finished building um, a, a, a beautiful spaceship which will be re ready for flight next year. Um, uh, Two hundred thousand dollars. Anybody? Anybody wants to go to space? I'm sure we could. Uh, uh, um, and um, uh, and I think it's going to be the start of a whole new exciting space era, both both for taking people into space, um, for much cheaper satellites into space, which will be very important for people who want to, you know, in, in, innovate use it using satellites. Um, one day for point to point travel um, at a much quicker quicker speed. Um, and um, one day for colonizing other planets, which, um, you know, I think, you know, in, in s the, the younger people in this room's lifetime, I think Mars will, will, will get colonized. And um, so, and, and again, because it'll be private companies doing these things, it will be uh, a, a lot cheaper than if governments were doing it. Okay, well, talk about the ultimate frontier. Maybe we'll have a Yalta summit on Mars, Victor. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, there you go. You and Richard could organize it together. We'll all come. Uh, so one of my favorite books about innovation is Michael Lewis's The New New Thing. Love it, right? So just as a quick final, final conclusion, I'd like to hear from Alec and then from Eric. What's your new, new thing? The thing that is just barely formed, maybe it's going to make you sound like a weirdo to even yeah. talk about it, yeah. that's going to be the next great thing. So I don't know if it's going to be the next great thing, and this will m make me sound like a weirdo. Uh, but in about 10 to 12 years, I think that the kinds of robotics that you've seen in the movies, some of the movies you've liked, are actually going to become commercialized and widely available. So robotics, I think, is going to be unrecognizable in 10 years relative to where it is today. OK, will there be a robot that can wash the clothes in my house and clean the kitchen? Uh, yes. I don't know how well they'll do it, but yes. Yay. Okay. So Bring it on. I gave you my new new thing, which is we are going to have kids writing computer programs in DNA. They're going to be writing life, writing new circuits in life. That is sufficiently crazy compared to what's going on right now that I think none of us can imagine what that's going to be like. I think we couldn't have imagined 15 years ago what the internet world was going to be like. My generation we're used to getting a clunky industrial DNA part here and there. They are going to write code. They are going to write extraordinary control programs. And I can't imagine what effect that's going to have on all sorts of things from agriculture to health. So uh, that's, trust me, sufficiently crazy, but it will happen. OK, well, thank you very much. What a mind-bending and mind-stretching uh, panel. Wonderful. Terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, and come back at 5.30 to hear more from Richard Branston and Mohammed Yunus.